welcome everyone. We have quite a few people who have joined today, so we will go ahead and get started. Um, thank you all for joining the Designing Medical Drone Delivery Systems Workshop. Um, we are very excited to have you with us for the next two or three days. Um, we've all been working very hard on this event for the last couple of months and really, really looking forward to spending some time with you all today. Um, we're going to get started with just a little bit of a welcome and some logistics. Um, and the first um, logistic is that we're having an issue with the Zoom this morning, unfortunately, and this hasn't happened in our, our many practice sessions, um, but our interpretation feature, there seems to be a glitch with Zoom today. Um, so unfortunately, it doesn't seem like interpretation is going to be available for today to French, um, but hopefully we will get this solved with the Zoom support today and have it back for tomorrow. Um, so Olivier, do you mind just um, uh, letting the French speakers know that? Merci. Uh, bonjour, bonsoir, um, tout le monde. Um, bienvenue uh, à l'atelier de conception um, de network uh, pour drone, uh, du réseau drone, d'un réseau drone uh, pour la santé. Malheureusement, aujourd'hui, uh, nous avons un problème avec uh, le, le, la fonction de, trans, de traduction française anglaise. Euh, malgré tous les, les tests que l'on a fait la semaine dernière et tout allait très bien, on, on, ce matin, euh, oh, oh, euh, nous avons un problème de, 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 de traduction. Euh, alors malheureusement, aujourd'hui, on semblerait que ça ne va pas être possible de faire la traduction simultanée en français. Euh, mais nous espérons bien, de un, que demain, le problème se, sera résolu et, que le, et deuxièmement, que nous aurons euh, la première journée euh, traduite en français euh, le plus tôt possible. Mais bon, malheureusement, aujourd'hui, euh, vu ce problème technique, euh, nous regrettons d'informer que la traduction française pas ne sera pas simultanée aujourd'hui. Encore euh, mille excuses et on espère que cette, euh, ce problème sera résolu demain. Go ahead, Gabo. All right, thank you. Um, so we're just going to get started with a couple of quick rounds of introductions. Um, so my name is Gabriella or Gabo Ailstock. I am going to be your host of our three days together. Um, I am the coordinator, one of the coordinators of the UAV for payload delivery working group. Um, so lots of your emails for this event, you've been coming through me or um, one of my co-coordinators, Rachel. Um, and we have an esteemed a uh, couple of guests with us today who are uh, members of our UAV per payload delivery working group and who are helping as our co-facilitators and have helped uh, design this workshop. Um, so first we have Ashley Grevy from USAID. We have Joni Robertson from PATH. We have um, Tavidas or Taudas uh, Jukauskas from UNICEF and we have Olivier DeFalve from Village Reach. We also have a couple of tech facilitators with us today. Um, so if you are having any issues um, with your Zoom, you can send a chat directly to either Rachel Hill, who is also one of the coordinators for Updog, or to Sierra Petrowski from Village Reach. And we also have um, a couple of guest panelists who are gonna be joining us today. So we have Abdullah Gai from PATH. We have Dr. Arshimen Makaya from Village Reach, and we have Innocent Main Jenny from Village Reach as well too. Um, so thank you to all of our uh, co-facilitators and our guest panelists and our tech facilitators for today. And we will be um, uh, working with you today. So uh, just to get started on a, a, a quick introduction to who we are as the UAV for Payload Delivery Working Group as well, um, we are a global community of stakeholders who are interested in accelerating the use of drone delivery in health systems. Um, so we've been around since 2016 and our working group has grown to nearly 400 individuals since then. Um, our primary uh, role is a knowledge sharing and facilitation working group. Um, we also do partner coordination, online events, events like this. Um, and we have a resource hub and a drone operations database. Um, and really, our goal is to accelerate the use of drones and health systems and to help our partners and our members and other people in this space also accelerate the use of uh, drones and health systems in your environment, which is what we're going to be talking a lot about today. 
Um, so now that you've gotten to know who we are, um, I want to get to know you all for, for a moment here. Um, so we're going to start with just a get to know you poll. Um, so we've just got two, uh, two or three quick poll quest questions for you. So um, we'll have Rachel go ahead and get that poll started. So our first question here is, um, which continent are you from? So I'll give you just a few moments to answer that question. We've got uh, two coming in. Now we have quite a few more. All right, we have about 25% of you now. We'll just give it about 10 more seconds to see who, if we can get anybody else. All right, so let's answer in five, four, three, two, and one. And let's go ahead and, oh, Rachel, it looked like, uh, did the poll just, uh, get restarted potentially. That's all right. Well, we'll give everybody another 10, 15 seconds to go ahead and answer the poll. It looks like we've got quite a few more people coming in now, which is great. So that's that's all good. <laughs> Glad that got sorted on the back end. All right, we've got about 50% of people. So I'll give everyone uh, five more seconds and four, three, two, one and let's uh, let's go ahead and end there and share the results, Rachel. All right. So, um, our first question: Which continent are you from? It looks like we have a great uh, smattering here. We've got um, three people from East Asia, the Pacific, uh, four people from Europe and Central Asia, and um, unfortunately, no one from Latin America or the Caribbean. A few people from the Middle East and North Africa and quite a few from North America and South Asia. And then looks like the majority of our participants today are from Sub-Saharan Africa, which is wonderful. And then our second question is, um, which best describes your organization? Um, so it looks like we have a, a good mix here of some from academia, um, some consultants, um, quite a few drone service providers or manufacturers, um, and then uh, other private sector, and then quite a few um, from UN organizations or multilaterals and bilaterals. Um, so that's great. Really, we're, we're looking forward to getting to know all of you a little bit more, especially um, on day two and day three as we go into our breakout groups, um, but this is a great start just to, to get a little bit of information about you. So um, let's get started also on our workshop objectives. Um, so as many of you have seen, um, you saw the title of our workshop is Designing Medical Drone Delivery Systems. And really our objective today is that you leave with the knowledge and tools to design a drone delivery system in your context, your work, your country, your program. Um, we here on at the UAV for Payload Delivery Working Group have been very involved in this space the last couple of years, and we've seen a lot of knowledge, a lot of tools, a lot of resources being shared about different parts of, of drones, you know, the technology, how to do community sensitization, maybe, how to uh, evaluate your drone program. But one thing that we've really seen has been missing in our tools and resources as a community is how you actually design that system so that you can get, get your desired outcomes. And so that's really what we're going to be focusing on today um, and looking forward to uh, sharing this knowledge with you all. And how we're going to do that is through a three three different days. Um, so today one is really about learning. So we're going to be sharing a lot with you all about the different concepts of what it takes to design your drone delivery system. Um, we're going to be doing a lot of talking today, so it's really a day of absorption. And then tomorrow we'll be doing a bit more of taking that information that you learned and doing something with that information. So tomorrow we'll be actually designing a drone delivery system uh, based on a, uh, a case study that we've come up with, uh, based on somewhat real life, somewhat mock, um, but you'll be taking a lot of that learning and actually doing something with it on day two. And then day three is really about applying that information. 
And so day three is optional attendance. Um, day three will be that you can bring some of your own work and we'll be running through a lot of what we do on day two again to design a drone delivery system. But we'll be doing that with a couple of different case studies that are actually from the other participants. Or you can bring some um, information that you wanna share with the facilitators or others and get some insight into how you can apply all of these different concepts into your own work. So that's kind of how the three days will be shaking out. Um, and then we'll, we'll go a little bit deeper into what we'll be doing on each of those days. Um, so today, our learning day, we're starting with our short introduction. Um, and then we'll be going through the different components of a drone system design. So we'll start with the conceptualization phase um, and really talking about what you need to do, what you need to understand before you design that system. We'll go into a planning phase um, where you're taking that conceptualization information and you're working with your stakeholders to plan what that system is going to look like and actually do that design. Uh, then we'll have a short break um, and then we'll go into the implementation section and just start with a couple of what are the key first steps for you to actually take that design and go forth and implement it. And then we'll just um, come up with a quick closing. So we'll be together for three hours today. And tomorrow, um, our doing day, uh, we'll start with just a quick recap of day one and a welcome. And then we'll have an introduction to what it means to actually facilitate a system design workshop, which I'll introduce that concept to you a little bit more um, today as well, too. And then we're going to spend the mo majority of our time actually doing that drone design together in small groups during our mock system design workshop. So you're going to be having a lot of group participation, a lot of talking, and so be prepared to come and uh, collaborate with some of your uh, other colleagues on the call today. And then we'll, we'll also do a short break. We'll come back for a discussion and our closing. And then on day three, our applying day, it'll be a very similar structure to day two and a reminder that this day is optional as well. Um, so again, we'll just do a quick welcome and a recap. We'll introduce you to some of the other case studies that some of the other participants have brought. Um, we'll go through that same mock system design workshop again, or you can um, bring some of your own work if you wanna talk through that in the system design workshop. We'll have a break and discussion and close out from there as well too. So those are our three days together and um, we have a very packed agenda. So we do just have a couple of things that we wanna ask from you as participants. We ask that you provide your full attention. Um, we do know that it's a long day, so it's about nine hours together, but we're really hoping that you can be present, not be on other meetings or not being on other calls, so that especially on days two and days three when we have those small group sessions together. Um, we really hope that you attend all three days, um, even though day three is, is um, optional. We really would love it if you could um, be there. Uh, when you're talking or if you're in your small groups, um, if it's possible to turn on your video, that would be great. Um, we know not everybody can with their bandwidth. Um, we do ask also that you stay muted um, unless you're called on. We will have some uh, parts of today where you can raise your hand and join in on the discussion. Um, so you can go ahead and just raise your hand on Zoom and we can call on you and you can unmute. Um, but otherwise, if you'd like to participate, feel free to just use um, the chat to be able to do that. Um, we don't have translation for today, um, so uh, that might be uh, tomorrow. If we do have the interpreters, interpreters back, um, just to speak slowly while you, when you are called on for those um, interpreters. Um, and then finally, the meeting will be recorded and it will be available online after this workshop. All right, so um, with that, uh, we will get go ahead and get started on a little bit of an introduction to what we call drone system design. So health commodity delivery remains a challenge for many countries, um, whether that's in urban environments, in rural environments, in high income countries and low income countries, many different people have different challenges with healthcare delivery and making sure that you're getting the right products to the right places at the right time. And these resilient, high performing and efficient supply chains are really the basis for any strong primary healthcare system. We believe 
on at the U of E for payload delivery working group, and I know many of our, my, our facilitators that are here with us today believe that drones can play a transformative role in health supply chains. And we're already seeing that in a lot of the work that we are doing at our facilitation team that many of you are doing as well too. And we, we think that a lot of you think the same thing, which is why you're here today with us. Um, we think that the potential benefits of drone delivery are really immense um, when it comes to supply chain optimization, that drones can facilitate two-way transport from hard to reach facilities. Um, they can reduce transportation time or a turnaround of laboratory samples, and they can integrate multiple health products into these supply chains rather than being focused on one uh, particular program or one particular disease. They can have more fast and reliable distributions, whether that's on demand or ad hoc um, or emergency, and they can maintain the cold chain quality during those, um, those distributions. They can increase health worker efficiency um, so that health workers sp are spending less time on logistics operations or on supply chain operations or leaving their health posts in some instances to go and collect uh, products. And they can even be sometimes a potential means of communication um, for some health facilities that maybe don't have um, internet or, or cellular connectivity. And finally, at the end, they can even increase health service utilization by bringing products closer to health facilities, having faster disease diagnosis and faster treatment for patients and potentially increasing the confidence in the healthcare system. But to get there, Drones really have to be a holistic supply chain solution. And so I'm gonna introduce all, you all to what we call a theory of change um, in our public health space. Um, and really what is this theory of change of how drones can create this impact of improving health and saving lives. Um, so our problem is that people cannot access health products or services when and where they're needed. Um, and for, for you to be able to, solve this problem, you really need to think about a drone system in a holistic manner. So you have to design a system that delivers health products by drones. You have to implement that system that enhances local skills, ownership, and acceptability. You have to generate evidence in, on what the performance of that system is so that you can inform your decision making. And you have to create partnerships for the sustainable adoption of drones as well. What that can result in is in the, the intermediate uh, outcomes is that drones are optimally integrated, locally operated, acceptable and performing as expected. Um, drones are absorbed into the current health system and sustained, and that drones are successfully adopted at a larger scale. What that can lead to in the long term is that you can improve the availability and products of health services, which ultimately can lead to your impact of improving health and saving lives. But what we're gonna be focusing a lot on at this workshop is really this first activity around how, which is really the pillar and the building block for achieving this impact. It's how you design that drone system to deliver those health products. Um, so we'll be focusing all of our days on this. And, and we, in the global health space, we tend to call this kind of our shorthand as system design. So we'll be referring to this throughout our meeting um, and just kind of the shorthand of system design and what is system design? So it's really the blueprint for how the supply chain should run and how all of the components of that supply system fit together and interact to improve health outcomes or to achieve that impact. And we like to, Think of that the system design comes in three different components, which are the three components that we'll be walking through today. The first stage is really that conceptualization stage that I mentioned. That's really the advocacy and the introduction of this process of system design, um, what drones are and what you need to get and move into that planning phase. Our second component is really is that planning phase where you're collecting data, you're validating data, you're selecting your sites, you're really doing the nitty gritty of how that system is going to operate. And then once you have that, that system designed, you move into your phased implementation. Maybe you start small with an initial implementation, you evaluate that initial implementation, you improve some things. And then once you have those improved, you expand that to reach more people. 
So the, even with those three components, there are a lot of cross-cutting considerations that you have to think about um, as you're moving through all three of those stages. So the first is financing, how you're going to pay for this innovation, what the long-term business plan is, um, it, are people bought into your innovation? Are the stakeholders that can approve your innovation or regulate your in innovation bought in? Um, what policies are currently in place that um, affect your, your drone system or what needs to be put in place? What kind of national health system strategies are in place that can um, influence your system design and influence your implementation? Um, what's the market potential? Um, what kind of capacity building do you need to do so that you can implement um, your system and what kind of um, technologies and services are available. So over the rest of today, we're going to be covering these three components of system design um, and we're going to be having those covered by our great uh, facilitators that are with us today from our partner organizations. Um, and we're going to be hitting all of these things. So this is just your overarching introduction today um, and we're going to be diving in a lot deeper from here on out. So I will actually turn it over to Taudis to get us started on the conceptualization component. Um, and again, just a quick reminder, if you do have any questions or comments, please go ahead and put those in the chat. Um, and there will be some uh, opportunities at the end of each of these components for a little bit of discussion and question and answer. So Taudis, over to you. Thank you, Gabo. Uh, good uh, morning, afternoon, and evening, everyone. But before I take the floor, I'll hand it over to Olivia to walk us through a um, conceptualization journey, and then I'll take it from there. Over to you, Olivia. Thank you, Teodis. Welcome, um, welcome everyone. We're so excited to have you. My name is uh, Olivier Defau. I am uh, from uh, Village Ridge, um, and also uh, I'm a co-facilitator of the UpDog, uh, the UAV for Pillow Delivery Working Group. So we wanted to, uh, next uh, slide. Wonderful, wonderful. We wanted to first start with with an overall description of where we want to get. So you're here most likely because you are either in the middle of planning a deployment of a drone delivery network in the environment where you work, or you are starting to think about it. And we wanted to, to really start by explaining that this, it's really a journey that you are entering. It is really a journey that is gonna take time and you have to be realistic. We, you need to be realistic with the, um, the long journey that you are starting with. And this is a, really a, a very high level description um, and we'll have opportunity to go deeper into the detail here, but this is the overview of the different phase from you know, the assessment phase, we're gonna be talking about this, the design phase, which is really specific to uh, the, the topic of this three-day workshop. Then the approval phase, once you have your design, you're doing planning, there will be a, a phase with many approval that you will have to get then you'll have the setup phase before you can start any operation. And then once you start your operation, you will have to go back sometime to the approval, sometime even to the design phase actually, uh, to optimize or as you are scaling up, your, scaling up your operation. And also going back to the setup phase because you know, you may have to modify how you deploying you or your network, or you will have to set up elsewhere as you are successful in growing up your network. And all those five different phases, under each of those phases, there is specific activities that each of them are as important as each other. So bypassing one will affect mo all most of the different activities under each phases. Starting, you know, the assessment. This is kind of the obvious, you, but still critical to really define your, what is the need? What is the problem you are trying to solve? And, and it is, is this problem truly a transportation issue? 
the root cause of your problem, is it really a transportation problem? Because at the end of the day, a drone, and in this case, drone delivery is addressing one specific problem related to transportation and accessibility. And once you are really sure that your problem is really related to transportation, you'll have to also evaluate the feasibility from a political standpoint. Do you have all the stakeholders, key stakeholders that are buying to the idea of exploring the education of drone? To also looking at feasibility from a enabling environment, and Todis is gonna talk about this enabling environment uh, in a minute around um, people, skills, competencies, about regulation, about infrastructure, and so on and so on. And Todis is gonna hit that in, in a second. Then once you have this, the spaces um, cover around the assessment, you start designing your network based on the need you have identified. You are looking at, you will look at how can I optimize my supply chain by integrating an additional mode of transportation? What kind of a drone would fit the, the, the most likely problem that I'm trying to, to fit in, in the environment in which you work, how am I going to measure that the introduction of this additional mode of transportation is actually beneficial, that it has a benefit to my supply chain, to my cost, supply chain performance, to the cost, to the health impact, the health of the population, because at the end of the day, we're here because we are trying to increase equitable access to health products. Then you have to go through, and this is really after you have designed, you have to have selected your drone technology. You have to have your design, design of your network, the route, where you're gonna put the hub and so on and so on. You're gonna have to go through a set of approvals of the obvious, the aviation approvals, but you also have to have some approval from the political standpoint that you, um, you'll you have an oversight committee most likely and all the people, the stakeholders and who are part of that committee, we're gonna talk about this, will have to approve. And then you have some security approval, um, approval from most likely from the defense or security authorities, customs for importation, ethics approval. Um, and, and then, Keep in mind, you'll have some approval, most likely at the different level of your supply chain, national, subnational, district, communities, all the way down to the communities. Then once you have that, you're gonna start working on your setting up. All the setup from the, the obvious, again, the, the assets, the drone assets and, and infrastructure and equipment. Uh, the people you're gonna have to hire, What but who you should be hiring? What are the skills that are needed to operate? Because at the end of the day, we want to operate your network. What are the skills that are critical to have? And you'll have some trainings, trainings on those skills, and 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 but from an operation standpoint, but also from a evaluation standpoint. Remember, you want to make sure that you are planning to measure the benefits in order to improve your system and in order to make sure that the people that you have has the skills and the knowledge required that are up to date and constantly growing. And it's only after all those different steps, we have 12 steps and each steps, uh, uh, Village Reach and the different partners in, in here with, in coordination with Updog has developed, it was currently developing uh, for each of those steps, uh, guidelines. It's only after that you're starting operating, but before, well, while you're operating, you have to plan your distribution. You have to work with your supply chain and logistics team to see again, how do you plan what's coming, what will be distributed via drone versus motorcycle versus truck, because again, the drone is only an additional mode of transportation. You'll have to, in the context of, of, of integrating all those vertical supply chain, you're gonna have to make sure that you manage the coordination 
between the different type of products that are usually falling under different programs. You're gonna have to, of course, manage the purely operation of your flights with your drone service provider or the team that is in charge of actually flying uh, the drone. You're gonna have to do some emergency, hopefully uh, emergency due to uh, uh, emergency on, on demand, uh, supplying your supply chain through a, an end demand process, or sometime you'll have some, hopefully not a lot, some some unplanned landing or, or, or some emergency landing. You'll have to coordinate that. Of course, in order to have your operation going ongoing, you have to plan and and ensure that you maintain, replace, service all the different assets from infrastructure you draw on and so on big component on quality insurance of your cargo, but also of the safety of the flights for safety reason. All this needs to be monitored. And that's where we go with a monitoring and evaluation of the of your network in order to, again, improve, continue, continuing improving your, um, your, your network, but also to inform the management of the fund most likely you will go and we'll talk about this, uh, that the service provider, you'll have a contract, probably a performance-based contract. Um, and to be able to measure that performance, we're going back to a good monitoring evaluation program. And finally, you wanna make sure as you operate a days in, days out, you will be working hands in hands every day with the regulators, with the civil aviation, and those are activities that are ongoing. It's not just at the beginning or at the, it's, it's ongoing. So this is just to giving you a flavor of the complexity in all the different steps that are needed to start operating and ongoing manners, you will have to go back to approval and set up and so on. This week, those three days, we will be focusing on designing and planning your network, which is only those here in, the, in, your, in your journey to a success, success operation, it's only here. And you will see it's already complex enough, but that's, you have way more other activities to be done, which will most likely be topic of different workshop later on. I'm gonna now let Todis take over to talk further on the conceptualization of designing a drone um, delivery network. Thank you, Tadis. Thank you, Olivia. And just to add, I think an important thing, just because of the complexity that goes into this entire process, we hope that it doesn't discourage you from not choosing the drone delivery programs because there are organizations that have successfully integrated the drone delivery into existing supply chains. And we see that it's really bringing the impact on the ground. Um, again, hello again, my name is Totis. I am drone specialist with UNICEF Supply Division based in Copenhagen, as well as I coordinate an interagency supply chain group, uh, UAS Working Group, which is a collective of donors. And as someone who has been in the shoes of drone delivery program uh, implementer, uh, I struggled to find the right tools, uh, frameworks and resources that would help me conceptualize uh, a drone delivery project. And you may wonder why conceptualization is so important. Um, based on uh, the field experience and the experience of our partners, I can confidently say that um, a thorough conceptualization, uh, which is often an initial stage of an implementation, can dramatically improve the results uh, of a drone delivery program. And most importantly, it can also provide an understanding of a challenge on the ground by shifting the focus from the solution really to the problem. And this can ultimately lead to a much more efficient uh, problem Tudis. solving. Sorry, Doris, you may so, want to uh, skip your scap slide. You're still yes, on Gabo, go ahead, yeah. That's, that's just an intro, so that's fine. So in, an important thing to point out in the area of conceptualization is that an outcome of conceptualization stage can also be a decision not to use drones. And that can be a very useful outcome. Uh, however, here today we are uh, uh, going to discuss uh, the 
the areas where and and come up with the solutions where drone can really be an impactful and transforma uh, transformational solution to the public health supply chains. So next slide, please. To better streamline the entire conceptualization process, we came up with this decision tree um, that tries to answer the overarching question, can drones help improve the supply chain performance that leads to the better health outcomes? And in order to answer this, we really need to look at uh, three different dimensions. First of all, a uh, problem space, that helps us really get to the root cause analysis of the supply chain bottlenecks to see if the problem is really related to the logistics transportation. Uh, then the secondly, enabling space uh, that helps us navigate through different elements of the enabling environment, which is a prerequisite for drone delivery program and can very well be a showstopper in many cases. Um, finally, a solution space that assesses available solutions on the market and helps choose the most appropriate modality for the selection of the solution and implementation of it. So in my presentation, let me quickly walk you through each of those dimensions by giving an actual example uh, of activities and resources that can be utilized during the conceptualization stage of drone delivery program. Next slide. So to understand the next one, please, as well, uh, to understand the supply chain bottlenecks, um, root cause analysis can help get to the bottom of an actual problem. And in order to uh, complete a thorough root cause analysis, uh, a multi-stakeholder consultation that involves public health uh, supply chain stakeholders is very much needed. So a lot of different parties need to be at the table. And here in the slide you have um, two scenarios that are described by the same overarching problem, really, which is medicines, vaccines, and medical commodities are unavailable for beneficiaries they, when they are the most needed. However, if you look more closely into those two scenarios, you could see that in scenario one, the stockout at the health facilities are mainly determined by the inefficiencies in information management, uh, stock reporting or stock ordering, as well as by the lack of route optimization from the district level. In scenario two, uh, on the contrary, uh, the stock availability is very much dependent on the lack of transportation options due to uh, frequent natural shocks, uh, poor uh, road infrastructure. And as you can see from these two scenarios, the overarching problem is really uh, the same. However, they have very different causes to the same problem. And therefore, understanding really the, uh, the, the, the root causes is essential to determine whether drone technology can be an appropriate solution in any given context. Next slide, please. So in determining uh, the root cause, a useful analytical framework is the supply chain rainbow that we use uh, and uh, that rainbow helps illustrate the different components that make up the health supply chain. And that includes operational areas of the supply chain as well as its enablers. And by applying this framework, it can um, really help understand which operational area or enabler is not performing optimally. Uh, and that understanding can really lead to a better understanding of the root cause or the bottleneck of the supply chain, which drones or any other solution can really help solve. Um, again, I think I need to emphasize that uh, in understanding the root cause, presence of all the health and public health supply chain stakeholders is really essential because these are the people who have really the wealth of knowledge and information that can help inform um, those decisions. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, after the problem space where we really end up is the enabling space. And I'd like to touch on three key aspects of the enabling environment, uh, which are important during the conceptualization uh, stage. Next slide. Uh, so really, firstly, regulations can be a real showstopper. And therefore, it's essential to determine whether there is a drone regulation in country. In case there is a drone regulation, I think there is 
you know, in a very simplified way, there is three steps that need to be fulfilled. First of all, really identifying and engaging the regulatory body and key in-country stakeholders related to airspace management and drone regulations. Then really understanding and internalizing the process of obtaining approvals for beyond visual line of sight flights where drone delivery is really uh, characterized by. And finally, identifying operational requirements uh, for the drone delivery activity. What it takes to actually get those flights approved. You know, what are the operational requirements, competency requirements, and any other uh, regulatory requirements that there might be in country. Uh, however, in many cases, as you can see, and I have actually provided the link to a great resource that was developed by the colleagues from the World Bank um, uh, and other organizations, droneregulations.info. It really provides the overview of what are the drone regulations in different countries. And as you can see, there is a lot of countries that do not have uh, drone regulations, particularly uh, in, in Sub-Saharan Africa. And in the cases where drone regulation is not available, you really need to understand and identify existing capacity and knowledge gaps in country to outline the plan for creating the regulatory environment. Uh, landscape analysis is very useful to understand what regulations are available regionally and internationally to draw on the best practices. Uh, then, of course, drafting uh, regulation uh, throughout a consultative process um, is, uh, is very important process. Uh, and finally, adopting regulations and allocating appropriate resources for oversight functions. It's a time and resource intensive process, but there is a number of countries, uh, including for example, Malawi, where I used to work, um, uh, they have gone through an extensive process of, of drone regulation adoption. And, and these are the countries that also show that there is great potential for the use of drones in delivery and other areas. Next slide, please. So after regulations, um, uh, there is obviously stakeholder management and community outreach, which is really, really essential uh, um, area that needs to be uh, taken into account during conceptualization stage. Um, uh, I think, you know, I thought this five-step approach really captures the key elements of the, uh, of the stakeholder engagement. Uh, starts with a strategy, um, uh, the stakeholder mapping is the second step. And I think the quadrant that is used on the, on the right side really helps um, map out stakeholders depending on their power and interest in the entire drone ecosystem. And I think this is really useful exercise that can be used and, and uh, hopefully we'll use it tomorrow during the workshop. Uh, but that really helps map out different stakeholders active in the space that can actually uh, be engaged throughout the process. Then fi uh, obviously preparation and, uh, and engagement uh, itself. Uh, there is multiple different mechanisms on how stakeholders and communities can be engaged using various types of media, um, uh, uh, many different types of mechanisms, such as working groups, steering committees. Um, uh, there is a lot of experience that has been built uh, within this ecosystem. A lot of experience can be drawn from uh, Malawi, DRC, uh, and other countries that have implemented drone delivery programs. Um, uh, what really needs to be emphasized here is, a, as you can see, stakeholder management is a continuous process. Uh, that keeps on going through the entire drone delivery program, no matter at which stage the program imp uh, implementation you are at. And it is important to emphasize uh, that as stakeholder engagement doesn't finish with the conceptualization, it really carries out through the entire program to really understand uh, what are the different interests from government stakeholders, but also most importantly, community um, uh, interests. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so in the space of drone delivery, uh, as many of you probably are already aware, sustainability keeps coming uh, as one of the main challenges and concerns. I can say this is a multi-billion dollar question. And we had, uh, if we had a straightforward answer, I think uh, we wouldn't be having this workshop. So that's the same challenge that you know many different organizations are experiencing. Uh, however, based on our and our partners' field experience, I believe we've got at least um, uh, a list of components that can help uh, inform the sustainable business case. 
and that ultimately can improve the overall sustainability of drone delivery as a part of supply chain. Um, and it all starts with the vision. Uh, for example, drone delivery as an additional mode of transport, uh, sort of a commodity service, which is offered by a private sector and steered, managed and supervised by the government. And in order to fulfill this uh, vision, multiple different elements have to be in place. Uh, and conceptualization stage is the right moment to reflect on those and actually put the sustainability theory into practice. Some of the key elements, drone can be a multi-purpose vehicle, right? It can not only deliver goods, but it can also be used for mapping purposes. It can also deliver multiple different goods. For example, it can serve um, different private sectors, uh, let's say mining, uh, oil and gas, offshore operations, as well as it can also be used for medical purposes. Uh, it can also be used for humanitarian response, emergency uh, preparedness, uh, disaster risk reduction. So really drones can be seen as multi-purpose vehicles. What that means for sustainability is that um, we can maximize the utilization of drone by layering different use cases and by finding different revenue streams to really offset the costs uh, or offset the, uh, the uh, capital investment. Uh, also cross subsidization, multiple clients can be possible that can help reduce the overall costs of implementation. Um, a lot of times implementers forget to consider financing mechanisms or who pays for what in the early stages. And I think conceptualization stage is so important to consider how drone delivery would be funded in the long term, considering it's a part of the public health supply chain. Is it a donor, government, private funded? Is it private public partnership or any other type of modality that can help support that activity for long term? Um, local ownership is very important and building local government capacity to steward and outsource drone delivery operations as a part of oversight uh, of the public uh, supply chain is very much needed. And that requires technical capacity building and, and appropriate finances. Uh, private sector engagement, of course, supporting and engaging local uh, private sector to overcome the market barriers to add drones as a commodity service and additional mode of transport for in-country logistics operations. We have very, very little local companies, particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa, who can actually implement drone delivery. And the local capacity, uh, local private sector capacity is so much needed to make it uh, more sustainable, to make it uh, local. Finally, capacity building in terms of providing technical experience um, in the area of, of drone technology is very much needed. I think uh, many of you might have heard about the African Drone and Data Academy that has, has been established by my colleagues at the uh, UNICEF Malawi. It really has proven a very successful and impactful program because a lot of the graduates from the ADDA have been already been employed by several drone delivery programs. And not only uh, they have been employed by private sector who utilizes drones as well as government agencies that, that are looking into this innovation. So capacity building is really a big, big uh, piece of that uh, sustainability puzzle. Next slide, please. And Finally, we come and or arrive at the solution space. Um, and while considering how to implement uh, drone delivery as a part of public health supply chain, organizations are really presented with two options, uh, either developing drone delivery capability internally or outsourcing the service to a third party. Next slide, please. And uh, insourcing, as we call it, or in other words, developing the capability internally, it really means uh, procuring drone as an equipment, um, uh, building the technical and operational capacity to operate uh, delivery drones and providing a drone delivery service uh, as an internal organization capacity. Outsourcing, on the other hand, means procuring drone delivery services by issuing a contract um, based on a competitive selection of a service provider 
through a tender process that builds on you know detailed terms of reference scope of work minimum performance requirements and, and specifications built in the tender documents uh, it's important to know that majority of today projects globally based on the medical drone and data uh, database which is hosted by updoc really uh, majority of today projects indeed use third-party service provider to offer drone delivery services and there is a number of different resources developed by colleagues from USAID, um, uh, Chemonics, Village Reach, UNICEF, and others on procurement of drone delivery services. Um, next one, please. Oh, you can go to the next one. Yes, I, I think I'll, I'll bid it here. Um, when it comes to outsourcing versus insourcing, really, we need to consider how much resources would be needed for either outsourcing those services or insourcing of potential drone delivery activity. Obviously, investment is higher if an organization wanted to develop the capability internally. However, the overall operational cost might be higher while outsourcing. And it's really, it takes the strategic organizational decision uh, depending on what is the importance of the activity and relative capability of our organization to decide whether the drone delivery should be outsourced or, or insourced. And um, this comes back to that really strategic question, um, uh, what is the critical activity and where the strength of the organization is, uh, whether it should focus on health policy making or transportation services, or maybe both. Um, uh, next slide, please. So really in wrapping up, what I really want to leave you with is this kind of the summary uh, slide where, and, and we'll be sharing all the materials, which I think really is the, uh, are the key elements of successful drone delivery integration into supply chains that primarily builds on proper problem and need identi identification, very thorough stakeholder engagement and partnerships that includes really multi-sectoral uh, consultation, then regulations and enabling environment that can often be a showstopper and that requires a lot of resources and time to build that enabling environment. Uh, fourthly, financing is very essential and that includes considering different use cases as well as different uh, revenue streams that potentially could help cross subsidize the delivery of medical commodities. Transparent and inclusive uh, solution selection where actually value for money is considered um, uh, while selecting an appropriate solution or service. And finally, which often is underrepresented uh, category is program management. There needs to be a, a proper program management uh, mechanism in place with all the people, resources, processes, and mechanisms in place to help you go through that drone delivery integration journey. Uh, thank you very much for your attention, and I want to hand over to uh, Gabo. Thank you so much, Taudis. Um, that was a really wonderful introduction um, to the conceptualization stage. Um, it doesn't look like we have too many um, uh, questions in the chat, so we'll, we can just go ahead and move on to our planning stage. But just a reminder, if you do have any questions, uh, feel free to put them in there and then we can ask at the end of each section. Um, so from here, I will turn it over to Olivier and Ashley. Olivier? Ashley? I'm here. Um, Ashley should be starting. I think she was here. I'm here, yes. Can you advance one slide? Okay. Do you want me to start, Ashley? Yes, please. All right. So um, just to, do you remember this? We're going to come back to this slide quite often. Uh, we are using this, this slide to really um, map out where we are. Uh, we just, thanks to TODIS, um, introduce you to the conceptualization uh, phase and we're now entering the planning. So the planning, what it entails, very many different steps going from the obvious, like, 
what is the appropriate drone technology? Uh, which technology is the most appropriate for trying to solve the problem that we identify? What product should I prioritize to carry? What data should I be collecting to measure the benefits of introducing drone? Um, and all those different questions, what sites should I be delivering? This is what we are gonna be studying, um, gonna be talking about during this planning phase. Next slide, please. So let's imagine that you have identified your problem. You have a transportation problem. Therefore, maybe the drone is the right, is potentially a good solution to help that transportation problem. And during you evaluation assessment, you have identify, for example, health facilities where you have stock out problem, where the availability of your product is the problem. But that doesn't mean that your drone is going to be the right solution to deliver, to deliver everywhere where you have an access um, availability of your product problem. You have to, drone is not the solution to every, to, 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 to solve your problem of every, everywhere. You have to look at and define where, what are the sites that should be considered to be the, delivered via drone, you have to look at not only like you start with your supply chain, you are looking at, okay, what are the storage? What are the CCE, the cold chain equipment? I don't know if your product is dependent of cold chain, then you know you have to take into consideration the, cap the capabilities, the cold chain capabilities, capacity, storage capacity, you have to take into consideration your, uh, the population that is covering by the sites. You have to take into consideration the location, the distance, you know, you have to look at, so if you have a facility that is way beyond uh, uh, the capability of uh, the drone technology that's available right now, well, that's probably maybe not the right site to, to go deliver. You have to look at connectivity how that because that will influence will i be able to coordinate my de my delivery um power with if you uh, um, uh your sites you deliver and has no power how are they going to be able is that the right place to go delivered for example on a routine basis is the sites where you are considering is it clear is it like in the middle of the forest is there any power line any building any trees any any infrastructure around it that will prevent a safe landing and of course you have to look at the human resources the people who are there will they have time will they have the resource will they have the the knowledge uh, um, to handle the coordination of this additional mode of transportation. And that will help, but those are just a few characteristics of that will guide your site selection. And keep in mind, you may have a site that where you can land, but maybe the sites maybe have, because of one characteristic that is not there, maybe it's, it's, uh, it's infrastructure, maybe, maybe physical infrastructure that does not allow to landing, or maybe it's too far or so on, or human resources. But maybe there is a site close by that also struggling with availability that actually fits pretty well for a landing site. So maybe you can land there, but it's only a few kilometers or miles from the other sites and so maybe you know you can coordinate between those two sites and and have a, a landing site and then have just 
by uh, by walking, if it's walking distance or a canoe or, or a bicycle, they can maybe provide then the delivery to those uh, satellite sites. So not every site has to be a landing site. A site that has a problem has to be a landing. There's other options. And we're gonna go through that during the system design workshop tomorrow. Next slide. You also have to prioritize what product to deliver. Yes, you have identified a problem, okay? You have a problem with the availability of varieties of product, but maybe not every product is appropriate to be transported by drone. And the obvious one is um, that we run into a uh, uh, question often is around mosquito, mos mos mosquito nets. This is bulky, this is big, not necessarily heavy, but I'll, maybe, maybe the product doesn't fit the, 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 the payload uh, compartment of any drone that's out there. You'll have to look at your product from, is it a, a product that is you know, predictable? Is it cold chain requirement? Does it require cold, active cold chain? What is the, the, the shelf life of your product? All those characteristics will influence which product should be prioritized versus maybe you can organize tier, tier one, tier two, tier three. Um, one is high priority versus medium versus low priority because of some consideration. Maybe your product needs active cold chain and, and there is actually no, no, no cold chain equipment performing or electricity at the facility. So maybe that product shouldn't be prioritized for that, um, for that delivery space. Or maybe it's too dangerous. Maybe it is, you're gonna to have to deal with regulatory uh, constraints um, for the product. Um, or maybe, you know, there is some political uh, priorities that will that may also influence your choice of product to transport. So all these to tell you, so what I'm trying to get at is that there is during your design a prioritization, looking at all the different products and trying to organize, prioritize which product sh should be considered first, second, and third because of different consideration. And this is just a flavor that influence the prioritization. Next slide, please. Let's yeah. next slide that. Oh, go ahead. Uh, go ahead, uh, Ashley, please. Yeah, I just wanted to, yeah, to add to that. Whoops, hopefully everyone can hear me okay. Mm -hmm. A lot of the factors that Olivier was just describing suggest product selections. They sort of open up opportunities. If, for instance, you're looking at facilities that um, don't have cold chain equipment, that don't have electrical connections, that suggests a direction that you may want to consider delivery. And then there are other specifications that limit what you, the products you'll be able to look at. So I, I look at it in those two, those two ways. There's a direction of different factors that um, point you in a direction, and then a set of factors that narrow your options, such as weight. One that he pointed out was, was weight limitations of the actual drone itself, and the volume as well. So volume is pretty uh, static. It, it is what it is. You can fit what you fit in the payload box. But in terms of weight, you have an opportunity to, to ask yourself, how far do I want to deliver? And do you want to max out the range of the drone, in which case you won't be able to carry as much weight? Or is it more important to you to carry products that are a little bit heavier or more of a product so it weighs more, and then you have to limit the range? Um, this slide, I think, introduces a, a, an additional concept of performance objectives for the supply chain, which looking at it more from a supply chain supply chain perspective, it's really important to consider. I'm going to recap a couple of things Olivier said from this perspective of the supply chain performance um, objective and, and putting categories into tiers because I think it's important to, to dwell on that for a minute. Have you ever heard the saying, um, you can do a project cheaply, you can do it well, or you can do it quickly, pick two, but you can't have all three? Um, I think that most public health supply chains 
do not have enough channels, enough distribution channels to meet all of these objectives because it can be very costly. So it's important to consider what performance objectives the existing supply chain is meeting and then what performance objectives you want your drone distribution channel to meet. So consider, as Olivier was saying, um, products that are true emergency products. Um, the, the logistics goal is, is responsiveness for the supply chain and speed, not necessarily cost effectiveness, not um, necessarily efficiency of the supply chain either. So the products you might be putting into this category of, of emergency commodities um, might be something to stop postpartum hemorrhaging. It might be an anti-venom, but you can, you can sort certain commodities into this very top tier high priority where um, the logistics goal is speed and responsiveness. But you may also be willing to meet other logistics goals just at a lower uh, priority tier of commodities. So for instance, if you're looking at a product that is available upstream, so it's, it's widely available in country, but is still stocking out for some reason um, at the, the health facility, that may be another tier of product. It still needs to get delivered. It still has stock outs but isn't uh, an immediate emergency for the supply chain. You just wanna put those as maybe tier two. And then there are commodities that are shelf stable, meaning that they don't require cold chain, that have predictable demand patterns. So facilities know exactly how much is needed, exactly when. Those you should be able to order far in advance. And the logistics goal then is gonna be consistency, right? Um, it's getting the system right and having reliable long-term transport where speed isn't as much of a big deal because you know so far in advance how much is needed. Those you might want to put into the lowest tier. Yes, we'll carry them if they fit on the drone and assuming that there isn't an immediate need for tier one or tier two commodities. So I think that point that was just being made about um, not just asking, sh should we deliver vaccines using drones? Should we deliver um, oxytocin using drones, should we deliver ARVs using drones, but, but when should we deliver them and in what contexts equally important? Back to you, Olivier. No, thank you. Thank you, Ashley. Next, next slide. All right. Also, talking about ordering and distribution, once you have, you know, prioritized your product, you have identified what are the sites where you're gonna deliver. Maybe they have some satellites, sites where we, you won't be delivering directly, but indirectly. Imagine that for each of the product that you have identified and prioritized, you have to collect some data, supply chain data, such as initial stocks but initial stocks in theory, but also physical stock, like in, in reality, how much is actually there? Not according to plan, but it's actually there. Wastage rate, average monthly consumption, stock of days, and, and so on. That will inform at first an adjustment. If it's a routine delivery, if it's a plan routine delivery with a schedule, you will have a plan that is maybe weekly, that may be bi-weekly, monthly, depending on the system in which you, you work with, but you will have to adjust and adjust based on those data and, and, and you will deliver those quantity. And then at end, this happened at each distribution. So during your system design, you have to plan the process Next slide, please. The process for planning that ordering that distribution. Those are the few questions that you will have to start answering, no, answer during your network design. How will the product move through my system? Who is actually, what happened the day of the delivery? You have to plan that who, when, where, how, using what tools, who is the decision maker, who has the final say, okay, 
this quantity will be transported via drone rather than via bicycle or whatever. What triggers those questions, who, when, where, how, when is the final decision maker make this decision? And where, depending on who is doing what, where is happening? Sometimes it may happen you know, at the management office, sometimes the storage room, so, sometimes at the loading path, different question will be raised at different time, at different location. All this has to be planned ahead of time, had to be documented. Is it, uh, how is this new mode of transportation and therefore distribution planning and ordering, does this affect the, the normal doc documentation, paperwork, the proof of delivery, the receipt of product? How do you adapt that to integrate? And maybe it doesn't, but most likely it will need to be adapted. How will people send, receive, drawn beside this procedure? All those are examples of questions that you will have to address and answer during your uh, your system design uh, workshop. If the weather is not good, what's going to happen? Your drone won't be able under certain condition. Your drone won't be able to um, to fly. What's the contingency plan? What's happening? How you have a set like for the month you have delivery that are planned, but oh that day we couldn't fly. What's the plan? Who made the decision? How to adjust those? those uh, delivery planning that you already made for the week or for the month. All this has to be <clears throat> taken into consideration uh, during the planning uh, stage. Next slide, please. So some, now I just wanna finish by giving you some, some learning from some of us who've, who've done it quite a few times to order to help you and learn from our mistake. <laughs> um, ensuring that everyone understand and agree on how product will be prioritized. Each person may have their own priority, his own, you know, everybody has to report and has his own priority. So you wanna make sure that we all agree from the very beginning of the process of how to prioritize and what product will be prioritized first and second and so on. All clear, all rule has to be clear and accepted by all. So that's why you have during your system design, you have to have all the parties involved. And because some decision will be made during the system design workshop, and you want to make sure that everybody agree and you find um, common agreement. Accounting for reverse transports, depending on the type of technology you'll be using, um, is also important as part of prioritization, especially when the destination health facility are very remote and difficult to reach. For example, vaccine may not only need to be delivered once a month at a health facility, but lab sample cannot wait a month to make the way back. You understand that some vaccine, so if you have a monthly distribution of vaccine, that doesn't mean that there is not all the product that need to be picked up more often. So all this has, so now you're introducing a different component if you technology allow it, the reverse logistics. So that goes also into consideration into your prioritization and your planning, the distribution pickup planning. It's a balance, really. Planning your distribution, it's a balance. It's a, something that is, you have to be agile and flexible and, and really being ready to adapt your distribution based on emergency situation, maybe. Or like I took the example earlier, what about if you delay? What about you delay because of you cannot fly? Your distribution will be, you will need to be adapted so please, when you, when, you know, when you do your planning, your distribution planning, distribution pickup planning, it's not something that, oh no, we made that plan, we stick to the plan. 
things will happen and will require you to adapt your distribution based on real life um, um, a real life situation. And actually, Ashley is gonna walk us through an exercise. I think this is next. Yeah, I think so. If we can advance one. So yeah. we're gonna split into some small groups. So I know that you've gotten just a lot thrown at you today. It was mentioned early on, today is a day of absorbing. Tomorrow you get to apply. And I think that's when it comes together and, and makes a lot more sense. We have a, a little bit of an opportunity to do that now. Um, so in our smaller groups, uh, we will be given one of two scenarios. So we have two different scenarios and you'll only be given one of them. And in that small group, you'll be given a little bit of information about the drone system that exists. You'll be told where you're operating, why you're operating there, um, what sorts of products you're carrying, and a little bit about the actual operations of the system, such as how communications work, how the technology is communicating with the pilot, and um, who's working on the receiving facility end. And I want you to take some time to absorb this information and then you'll be given a scenario where something has just gone wrong or potentially gone wrong. And so we need you to answer these three questions. I don't know why they all say one, that's funny. Um, but first consider which stakeholders need to be immediately informed. So this has just happened. The scenario we're going to give you has just happened. Who are the first people that you tell in the first 10 minutes, in the first hour, who's gonna to need to know um, in the near future term? Second, how are you gonna prioritize your actions? Because the implications of any potential drone incident may extend out for days, weeks, or months, depending on the severity of the incident, you may have to investigate um, what, what happened with the technology, you may have to work with civil aviation to update your procedures. Um, but I want you to focus on the first 24 to 48 hours. What do you need to do and how do you prioritize? And then finally, um, this is where really imagining scenarios can help you to plan. But what tools do you need in order to respond? What documents, um, what phone numbers, what systems, what human resources, what tools do you need in order to be able to respond effectively? And just take some notes in groups on your answers to each of these questions. And then when we reconvene, we'll give you about 10 minutes, hopefully. When we reconvene, we'll ask for a volunteer from each group to just share one to two insights of you know, what surprised you or what was most helpful. So um, facilitators, please, copy these questions. Um, we'll paste them into the chat in the small groups and we can split out whenever um, whenever we're ready. So um, there will be one group that I will be facilitating in French. So I want to remind everyone there's a, a new people since we started. Um, unfortunately, we're having some Zoom issue today. Uh, even though we practice and practice and practice last week, it was working perfectly. The translation, uh, la traduction, uh, le, la fonctionnalité de traduction uh, en Zoom ne marche pas pour l'instant. Uh, nous ne savons pas pourquoi. Nous allons, nous espérons que nous allons que nous allons uh, réparer cela pour demain. Mais pour cet exercice, uh, il va y avoir un groupe. Euh, et nous allons vous mettre dans ce groupe-là, les, les, les personnes francophones, euh, où je pourrais faciliter en, directement en français. So, Gabo, ou Sierra, who is, um, let's divide, yes. See you.
Hello, everybody that has left, please enter your breakout rooms.
That was great, but short. <laughs> very short. Didn't have enough Super time. Short. Agreed. Agreed. We didn't either. We're we're actually doing um pretty okay on time right now. So if if maybe um I don't know Ashley and Olivia, do you want to go back into the breakout yeah. rooms for another five minutes? That'd Let's do that. Yeah, that would be great. Okay. Let's yeah, go Rachel, back to our group, guys. Thank you. Thanks.
Hi everyone, welcome back. Um, we'll just we'll just wait until everyone is back from our breakout rooms, and we'll uh, turn it back over to Ashley and Olivier. Are we are we gathered back? It looks like everyone probably is. We got kicked out of our room, so. Um, we didn't have time to designate a volunteer, so I'm hoping someone from my group will step up and maybe share. We, we did exercise two. If we could go to the next, they don't build on each other. They're completely independent. Um, but could someone that was in my group maybe Ashley, volunteer a couple of findings? Maybe Ashley, before you give your team uh, the scrap, can you describe very, very briefly this exercise two? We did exercise one. We didn't have time to do exercise two. So maybe for, for some of us who have not very briefly and vice versa, when exercise one comes, somebody can, can summarize, summarize it. Absolutely. Why don't, I would love if someone in our group could also do a brief summary. Checking the participant list to see. Oh, so we had we had we had we had a scenario. Hello. Yes, go ahead. Yes, we were given a scenario where you you you, you a flight or one of the drones is producing smoke towards the end, where someone is supposed to get say uh, the the vaccine va vaccine virus. Uh, so, as an emergency, eh, we were talking about it on how how do how then do you move forward knowing that you are in an emergency situation. So we talked about issues like um, alerting those that are there, the one who is oh the, I mean coordinating with the one who who has alerted you because he's on the ground so that at least there should be no injuries. Where the injuries, the the post emergency situation, we also discussed about uh, what then would you do after the, the you have noted that there is an emergency, and how do you alert the community? How do you alert? How do you tell everyone else on what happened? In a summary, I think that's what we talked about. Yeah, thank you. Um, is there anyone else from our group that had a, something to add about what we discovered? Maybe just one more thing? Yeah, perhaps I can jump in. Uh, this is Posta. So I think one of, one of the kind of key insights or takeaways for me is really around um, assumptions versus kind of validations and how do we how do we move forward um, you know, with limited information that we have and then try to you know, figure out how we can validate some of the assumptions that we have to take the right course of actions? I think that would be kind of key take out for me. Excellent, really good point, yeah. Did anyone else do um, exercise two? We did. Was that you, Taudis? Yeah, our group did. Yeah. Over to you. Do you want to have your group share a little something? Yeah, of course. Uh, we we even got time to assign the the volunteer. Do me. Thanks. Thanks for volunteering. Over to you. Thanks, Tautis. Um, so in our group, for, uh, where we had the scenario where the drone crashes, uh, who are the first people to to notify immediately? So on that one, one, we had the civil aviation needs to be notified immediately. And then the community itself, but through a designated person. So this could be a community chief uh, or other designated person who we tasked with uh, communicating to the, uh, to the community. You would also need actually to, uh, to, to communicate to people like the fire response team to be on their way. Um, in, the, in the case of what, what, what would you prioritize within the first 24 to 48 hours? We're looking at one, having a search team to track the drone. So this could be from your staff members um, as well as the community. Secondary would recommend maybe to seize other drone operations until you find the drone that crashed and analyze exactly what happened. 
this may prevent the same happening with the other uh, drones that are within the, uh, uh, the vicinity. As well as we, within this time, it's time to manage publicity to say what news and uh, actually how is the scenario uh, presented out there? Because if the scenario is presented in the wrong way, it might then affect future drone operations. Um, when, when, when it comes to what tools could help the team in such a scenario, we, uh, we talked about having, for example, multiple backup plans for let's say GPS, um, because the drone only had some SMS uh, tool for reporting. If the, if, if the drone can have multiple broadcasting, uh, such as GPS, uh, SMS and physical forms, and then th that, that can help. Yeah, thank you. And thank you. maybe you could talk on that. No, we really had a great group present, uh, group conversation and discussion, really many good points raised. Uh, I think we are limited on time. I think one thing that really came across very clearly is to have a thorough contingency and emergency planning as a tool um, uh, that actually defines the algorithms on who gets to contact, uh, who gets contacted in uh, early hours of emergency, what gets prioritized, uh, so, that, you know, number of our uh, participants uh, highlighted uh, that. And uh, I think another point that was made by one of the participants is really like, uh, it will be very context dependent on who gets contacted, because in some cases, it might be law enforcement, in some cases, it might be community, but in some cases, it might not be community, not to create uh, additional um, alarm or until you know the the, the true uh, data and information. So I think that's it from uh, from our team. Over to you, Ashley. Great, thanks, Tata. That came out in our group as well, that idea of you have a minute to do this, you've got 10 minutes to do that, you have a half an hour. And so having a plan in place and maybe even assigned roles, I think, um, will really be helpful. Tata, let's go over to you and your group. Sorry, did I say Tata? You just yeah, did that. Exactly. I meant to say Olivier. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I was I was wondering. <laughs> All right, so we um we worked on ex exercise one. So if you could uh, put the slides for exercise one, um, and I'm gonna very briefly describe the 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 scenario here. Um, and one of my um, colleague in uh, the the francophone team, but I think they speak quite good um, English as well, or even if you want to do in French, uh, just uh, just go ahead uh, when I'm, I'm done with, with the scenario. So the scenario here was, um, you know, in it, you have a, a drone that, that took off that uh, to deliver some, uh, some goods, but dangerous good blood, for example, including blood. Um, and uh, there is an unexpected landing um uh, at mid mid flight uh, where the drone actually landed somewhere um in the middle of nowhere it was unpopulated but in mountainous and we lost connectivity so uh, we kind of know approximately where it landed but we don't have we lost connectivity at the end which means that we don't exactly know where it is so and it is that it is you know uh, uh, far away. It's a sixty uh, straight line. It's sixty four kilometers on straight line. So it's that means that it's quite a long journey to go um, to go retrieve the product and the drone. So that's the scenario. Uh, so uh, somebody maybe um, come come in and maybe talk about the mobile. We spend a lot of time talking about the mobile uh, 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 emergency response. Somebody in my in my group, please come in and explain a little bit what we discussed. Le France, le francophone, s'il vous plaît, il en faut que quelqu'un vienne et décrit un petit peu ce dont on a on a parlé pour l'équipe 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 de. Allez vas-y. Yes, yeah, so so we, we, we also had a quick discussion about, about the, on the case. Um, 
uh, the, the key takeaway was that it is an emergency uh, case and then uh, the priority should be uh, at the security level and the main things that people's security level, what kind of damage that the, that, that drone can actually uh, cause where uh, it, it landed. So uh, the, the, the team actually to, to take care of that was uh, primarily the, the, the civil aviation, but it's really at the, at, the, at the local level because it's one, one once again, it's about the agency. Uh, so the alert is so, 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 to contact the, the civil aviation. And then uh, the, the, the procurement center, you know, where the drone is coming from and uh, where it's supposed to uh, deliver the, the, the product. Um, together with, uh, um, I don't know, a, uh, a medical doctor or anybody that can help out on, uh, you know, um, uh, I, I don't know, um, securing or coming to support, you know, if there was an, an injury coming from something or, or, or else. And the, the other uh, person that needs to also be part of the team is the, is the technical, is one of the, the the local drone operator or technical person. Thanks, Don. Oui, donc, um, en, en, en bref, merci beaucoup, beaucoup, uh, Jawad. Le, vraiment, l'élément uh, que l'on a discuté, c'est c'est des grosses distances, donc c'est vraiment planifié ahead of time. Qui va... Oh, sorry, I'm switching to English, sorry. Uh, it's, a, it's a long distance, so really thinking about who should be uh, going to retrieve the assets, to retrieve the health uh, product, and also to make sure nobody got, got hurt and, and, make, and take action. So deciding where, which group and whom looking from a safety, 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 number one. So you want to make sure that you have somebody who will be able to take care of any injured people. You want to make sure that there's somebody who's going to be able to take care of the cargo. The cargo, it's a, it's a dangerous good. So you want to make sure that you have somebody that is that will know how to handle the cargo. You want to make sure that there's somebody to ensure the security uh, 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 you never know what kind of reaction um, you may have triggered with an emergency landing. Some somebody from security. We talked about somebody that is related with the uh, uh, air uh, control, traffic control. Somebody related to the aviation uh, standpoint, and finally technology standpoint. Somebody that is involved with the coordination of those flights who knows. Uh, uh, the drone and, and what to do with the drone once you found it. So really a lot of different people playing different role during an emergency response. And that is part of the planning. Good point. Over to you, Ashley. Yeah, i um, actually gonna hand straight to Gabo and see what your group said. Yeah, and I'm gonna hand it over to Andy actually. Um, we, we discussed a lot that was similar. So I think the one thing we haven't talked as much about, which maybe you can just focus on Andy in just like one minute is around some of those tools that would be needed in to prepare in the planning stage to respond to these emergencies. Yeah, no problem. Um, I, one thing that I, I noticed is at least for ours in terms, we, one of the discussion points was on communication and in our, emergency response plan, the first person we contact is actually our focal person at the Civil Aviation Authority of Malawi. And then the second point of contact is always the individuals that are our are, are drone focal people at the health facilities. And I think that this is really important because they are the advocates for drone delivery and they know the neighboring villages and they can contact like village chiefs or um, other uh, workers at other health clinics that are nearby just to make sure that there's someone on site. And then the second thing that we talked about is so at Wingcopter, we have uh, an emergency response plan that's in place um, so that every role, whether you're the control unit operator, the chief remote pilot, or the safety pilot, you have your, your designated roles when something like this takes place. So a control unit operator is responsible for all of the communication and for sending the coordinates. The safety pilot is responsible for grabbing the emergency response kit 
which has everything from a fire extinguisher to a fire blanket to extra batteries, um, cash, water, um, a battery charger, for example, a vest, and um, essentially, it's their role to get to get on the road and to get to the drone as quickly as possible. Uh, when we transport dangerous goods, for example, all of our, our drone, as well as the delivery box, as well as the packaging within the delivery box, is all labeled with biohazard signs so that it lets communities know um, or people that are surrounding the drone that um, they that they should be careful that the that the that whatever the cargo could be could be dangerous. Um, and I would say just the next step is, uh, yeah, is really containing the situation as much as possible. Thank you. Thanks, Andy. Those are all really practical considerations. And Joni, I think your group is last. Yeah, thank you. Can I share my screen, um, Gabo? We just took notes as we spoke and uh, Gregor, is going to take us through the discussion. And Gregor, I know we don't have that much time, so maybe just um, one or two highlights from the discussion. Yeah, sure. Uh, th thanks for that. And uh, you all covered a lot of excellent points already. Uh, the, the one that was probably not covered yet um, to that extent was to let the remote health clinic know that their delivery may be delayed. Uh, because it, from the scenario, it appeared that it was a rover pilot at the central location that found out that's not happening and that the drone has landed somewhere. Otherwise, a lot of the points were already covered. So it's really making sure the remote clinic knows it's uh, notifying the civil aviation authority that the drone is no longer in the airspace. Um, it's at some stage also notifying the insurance provider that the drone may have uh, been damaged. Uh, when it comes to the first 24 or 48 hours, it's really invoking that emergency response plan that Andy mentioned um, that should be in place. Uh, the operator should have all the contact details um, and it should lay out the steps on, on what to do, how to resolve the situation and what steps to take. Um, and in terms of the tools, it's really that emergency response plan as the most critical tool, but also having a communication plan that should be in place um, over as part of that emergency response plan, but it should also cover that community engagement element early on in the operation um, and should also feature in the concept of operation as sort of a broader overview of how the operations will take place and what steps should be taken both during normal operations and also in contingency and emergency situations such as this one. Thanks a lot, Gregor. Back to you, Ashley. Yeah, you're reminding me that this isn't just one drone, even though we're facing one incident in these scenarios, you both have been presented with a fleet of drones. And so you have to consider the safety of the entire fleet and the implications for the whole system. Um, although, of course, that's different than the immediate 24 hours after that we were talking about. We do have just two slides left in this section, but I know we also have about a minute left until we were planning to take a break. So. Um, Gabo, what are your thoughts on us finishing this up quickly? Yeah, let's just uh, go through these last um, two slides and then we will we'll go into our break. Olivier, are you uh, presenting these? Um, I was not planning on, uh, but I guess- I can do it, that's fine. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's okay. Right. Um, so yeah, so our, oh, let me start my video. There we go. So. Um, Really, the last component of the planning stage is planning for how you're going to monitor your performance of your system. And that's really important so that you can identify problems early in your system and you can identify solutions for this continuous improvement process. Um, as drones are really a new innovation, we don't have all the kinks worked out. There's always gonna be problems that come up in your system. And so identifying a plan for how you're gonna monitor for the good and the bad and then improve based on that is really important during this planning stage. Um, and it really requires different data based on the maturity of your drone operations and also the outcomes that you want to receive. And identifying what type of data you do need to collect is the most important thing that you need to do in this planning stage. And it's not always so obvious. Um, so 
we have this tool here, which is called the Drone Evidence Generation Toolkit, which is a very comprehensive toolkit that can actually help you identify that right data that you need to collect from the start of your operations before you start operating so that you can develop that monitoring and evaluation plan. And so this evidence generation toolkit contains a couple of really important tools um, that you can uh, you go and explore yourself. So the first one is really around a decision tree um, so that you can identify what the maturity of your operations are so you can see what type of data you need to collect. Um, the next is a logical framework, which is similar to that theory of change that I presented in the beginning that kind of shows you the different steps in your system and the different activities that you need to do in order to get your desired outcome. And next, which is really the meat of this toolkit, is that it has a very comprehensive list of key performance indicators that you can use and you can adapt so you don't have to start from scratch. Um, and that's shown here on the right side of the screen. Um, and it breaks down these different uh, KPIs per different components of your system. So for regulations, for supply chain benefits, for stakeholder community acceptance, um, for other outcomes, uh, for uh, reg uh, uh, local capacity is an example of one. And then it has different data collection tools that you can adapt um, so that you don't have to start from scratch again on how you actually collect that data once you know what data that you want to collect. Um, so we'll we'll send out this tool afterwards um, and I can just kind of cut it cut it a little bit short there because we also do talk about um, mon how you actually implement this continuous improvement plan in the next section. Um, so I will uh, turn it back over to Ashley and Olivier for any um, just closing statements before we, we go to our break. Um, from my side, I'll just say, I know that we have crammed in a lot of considerations. I hope that this helps to illustrate that really before you can even begin the actual design of a network, there is so much data that you need, so much research, so many interviews with people, and that this is really a very, very long process, and you have to be very realistic. I, I've been in scenarios where people have asked me, we're interested in drones, can we have them flying in two months? And, and I, I, no, I, I think it's very difficult, and it depends how much legwork you've already done, um, because there's so much consideration that needs to go into it. Yeah, I mean, just adding to to Ashley's comment, it's this is just an illustration of different elements you have to think about, and what we are hoping here is to provide you with a realistic expectation of what it takes to do the planning. In this case, we're in the planning stage, uh, and the different elements you have to plan. Uh, before you even start with your authorization and setting up and so on. You remember the, the whole journey to uh, maybe that, that would have been good to, to put back this, this slide here, but this is like even before you even, you know, uh, 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 plan your procurement of your, of your, uh, of your drone and importation of your, is before you do the authorization, is before you start your training, is before you start so many different things. And yet it's still a lot of work. And this work is critical for the success um, afterwards. So please consider this being critical and do not underestimate the time and the resource needed to do this, this good planning. Over to you, um, um, Gabo. For the All break. right, well, thank, thank you both so much. Um, so we do have a little bit of time for a break here before we go into the implementation section and taking all of this and then actually applying it and what you need to plan for to implement. Um, so it is five minutes after the hour. Um, so let's come back in eight minutes. Um, so that will be at, it's uh, seven o'clock for me right now, 7.05. So that'll be at 7.18, uh, um, or sorry, 7.12, uh, <laughs> uh, or 12 minutes after the hour for whoever else. Um, and so I'll give you all a little bit of short break. Uh, go ahead and just leave yourselves on mute and then you will hear us start talking it again when we start again. And if you, but during the break, if you want to, if you have questions, feel free to put them in the chat. We'll be monitoring the chat and, and answering them as they come. All right, we will see you all back in about eight minutes.
All right, everyone, um, we will be gathering back again. I can just give everyone just one more minute to come back. Um, and I will just ask that our next speakers for the next session, the implementation session, just um, maybe come uh, put your video on so I know that you are back. All right, we'll just give it a few more seconds. Um, I'll just check if um, Innocent and Abdullah, if you're if you're here, if you just want to go ahead and put your uh, video back on, indicate that we are ready to start the next session. All right, Joni, do you want to go ahead and get us started? Yep. Oh, I think you might be muted. <laughs> yeah, I was struggling, struggling with the mute. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome back. My name is Joni Robertson. I am a program advisor at PATH. I'm based in Seattle, Washington. And um, just want to thank everybody again for joining. This is a long session. And we really appreciate your attention so far and the great participation in the breakout. Um, I think it is a good indicator that you all are very energized. And so I hope you've had a little, a good little break. And we'll go into the last uh, section of this meeting for today. We've heard from colleagues about the conceptualization stage and the planning stage. And now we're going to move into a session on implementation. And to do that, we have invited some colleagues who have been involved in projects in Malawi, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, and in Senegal. Um, so I am going to provide a brief introduction to these folks, and then we're going to start off and we have um, five brief sessions, and then afterwards we'll um, we'll engage with a little question and answer. So um, first of all, I'd like to introduce my colleague at PATH, Abdullahi Gay. He's a senior program officer at PATH in Dakar, Senegal. He works in the field of supply chain and logistics management for vaccines. He leads a drone project in Senegal that aims to carry medical supplies and lab samples to island facilities, or to and from, I should say, island facilities in a river delta region. Um, we also have two colleagues from Village Reach. I'll introduce first Dr. Ashimed Makaya. He's the drones for health program manager for Village Reach in the Democratic Republic of Congo. He's a medical doctor with more than 15 years of experience working on supply chain programs that serve communities at the last mile in the DRC, including work on drone delivery. And last but not least, uh, we have Innocent Ma'in Jenny. He works as a supply chain program manager for Village Reach in Malawi. He leads the Drones for Health pursuit in Malawi, which is aimed at delivering health products to underserved populations in hard to reach communities. I think we'll start with Dr. Arshimed. Are you ready? Unfortunately, Dr. Arshimed's internet cut right before <laughs> this. Of course, of course. Of course. Um, so I think um, maybe we can just uh, go on to um, Innocent. Maybe you can start with the community outreach section and we can give it a minute and see if um, Arshimed is able to join back again. Um, and then if, if not, we can just circle back to the end and I can cover uh, his slides. Great, thank you, Gabo. So Innocent, you have the floor. Hi, everyone. I hope you can hear me. 
Yes, we hear you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, I would like to actually appreciate um, all the participants and as I've already been introduced and I'll go straight into taking you through the uh, community outreach section. So next slide, please. And I think as we begin talking about this, I just wanted to uh, make sure that we understand that I think we're looking at um, some great uh, uh, concepts that have actually worked in our setting, for instance, even in Malawi. So understanding also that there is some contextual sort of uh, uh, understanding that has got to go uh, into this. But what I wanted to actually uh, talk about is that if you look at the community outreach, we're looking at a balance of science and art in engaging the community uh, that are targeted by the drones. And why we're talking about balancing the science and art is because of those particular sort of uh, uh, areas that we have to look at as we do the community uh, outreach. And then why should we be talking about the art? It's because the community outreach involves application of knowledge in the real life situations. So thinking outside the box in looking at what is really happening at the moment and what do we really have to do? Whereas the science side is actually looking at, you know, a systematic body of knowledge. So looking at the cause effect relationship through observation, study and practice. So looking at these particular two angles is very critical in making sure you strike the better balance as you do the work uh, around the uh, community outreach for Drones for Health programs. And let me also be quick to say that this is an iterative uh, process and it actually uh, uh, involves what we call a human-centered design kind of approach. And for those of you that might not have heard about the human-centered uh, sort of design approach, it's where you actually make sure that those particular sort of communities that are being targeted by the specific intervention are actually involved in the process where you do a lot of inspiration, getting to understand what they actually go through in their day-to-day -day lives and their you know, cultural understanding of issues and all that. And then you do ideation in terms of where you actually talk about what is it that you really need to actually do to solve the challenges that are actually they are actually uh, facing. Um, and then you do the actual implementation. And that doesn't end there, because after the implementation, you go back and forth through those particular processes, trying to make sure that you are at the end of the day, making sure that you are uh, putting those particular initial thoughts that came from the communities uh, uh, first. And then why this community outreach is important, obviously, you want to make sure that societal uh, aspirations are on board, because this actually increases the ownership by the communities that are actually uh, are being serviced by the drone technology. And then you also want to encourage a, com a communal or civic engagement. And I think this is linked to the last point there where we're talking about creating a deliberate feedback loop. I'm glad that I think in the just recent sessions that we are discussing, we did talk about those particular scenarios. And I'm glad that a lot of things that came out was around, you know, issues around how do you engage the community. So this particular community outreach, as you do the initial stages, is very important to create a deliberate feedback loop that you actually use to actually engage the communities. And then also you want to make sure that you're improving on the learning outcomes, but also you want to build relationship and trust with the communities that you are serving. There was also a point that was mentioned in the, um, in the breakout sessions that we are talking. I think someone in our group was actually talking about, it was actually Ashley, who was actually playing the devil's advocate and then saying, how do you ensure, for instance, as you're communicating with those particular sort of incidents, how do you ensure that you don't uh, actually lose trust of the communities? So that's a sort of process that becomes very important, the initial community outreach, to make sure that even as you do the further communication at the later stage, you have actually engaged these particular colleagues uh, very well in terms of the trust that they understand what you're actually doing. The next slide, please. And then I just also wanted to, to, to actually talk about uh, that when you look at community outreach, in terms of who needs to be involved, in a nutshell, is actually you need to make sure that you are as inclusive as possible. And I think I just uh, we, we, we just sort of provided like a snapshot of some of those particular sort of areas or sort of uh, sectors that you need to consider as you look at the community outreach. So we're talking about the leadership and we talk about leadership at all levels. So 
for instance, I think in Malawi, we have a situation whereby we have local council, which has got leadership. So we're talking about local council leadership and down to the community level. So make sure that the leadership at all those particular levels is actually uh, 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 engaged and actually they, 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 they are actually uh, uh, engaged as a community. And then local health promotion experts, because I mean, there are of course general um, understanding in terms of what needs to go into the community as you do the engagement. But you also want to actually be discussing this with the community in the context of what has worked and what has demonstrated not to work before. So this critical, uh, you know, the role of the uh, health promotion experts locally becomes very handy because they are able to give you, you know, a snapshot into what uh, actually need to make sure you are considering as you do that. And I think one other key thing that will also become handy is the key influencers, which represent different societal sectors. So you could be talking of local readers, you could be talking of local educational experts, in those particular communities, because these are the people that when they do communicate to their communities, they are able to actually be heard and people are actually able to respect what is actually mentioned or said by them. And then, as I did mention, you're talking about making sure that those multiple stakeholders from all those particular angles are being considered. So the health side of things, the aviation side of things, they are all brought on the table as you do the community outreach so that the messaging that you do is actually something that is comprehensive, uh, but more uh, basic also. So as I mentioned, I think overall we are looking at involving as much people as possible. And I think we are all uh, aware of this particular common acronym uh, team where actually uh, it was actually called to say, together everyone achieves more. So we are looking at all those particular bits and pieces combined, they will actually come up with something which is actually uh, a great outlook. And then in terms of how, it's supposed to be done, not being exhaustive, but just providing some tips is actually the need to make sure that you actually include cultural information or beliefs overview. And I think this is very applicable, especially in the settings that we work in, for instance, in Malawi, and I believe perhaps in most of the um, you know geographies in the world, there is always a cultural con uh, context to which drones can actually be viewed by the communities. But also you need to be actually looking at what other key lessons have come from other programs in other geographies because you also don't want to re, sort of reinvent the wheel but you just want to be leveraging on already existing lessons um, <clears throat> of successes that have worked elsewhere and then you're also looking at not focusing on a single approach so you're looking at multiple approaches that have got to be used as you actually do community outreach so it could be audio uh, or visual sort of approaches or use of you know, uh, uh, information ed and, and education um, uh, 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 materials, um, and then making sure that you do comprehensive orientation of the key implementers uh, for the community outreach. So for instance, if you're going to involve the key influencers, make sure that they are comprehensively informed of what actually this what actually entails in this particular drone implementation so that because they're going to be the first sort of line in terms of response as the information comes out. And then ultimately, in terms of the uh, output, you're looking at execution of an outreach approach that takes on board key considerations that we've mentioned there, but also making sure that as, we, as I did indicate, you have a feedback loop so that if there is need to actually be able to actually get feedback from the communities in terms of how things are progressing, you actually get that. But also I think simplified surveys where you can actually go into the communities and just get to get a sense of whether the communities have an understanding about what is happening would actually be great. Um, uh, next slide. And I think that should be drawing us to the, um, to the close of this particular, uh, session. So I think in a nutshell, the take home point, if I were to reiterate, is the fact that you need to make sure that you are actually putting the local context at heart. You are making sure that you are being as inclusive as possible by making sure that all the relevant uh, stakeholders at community level are engaged. And then that's the recipe that you're going to have for success in this particular uh, endeavor. Thanks and over back to you. Thank you so much, Innocent really important points about um, involving the community. So important for success. Gabo, do you think we should go to, is Ashimed available yet or?
No, he hasn't been able to come back. So let's just keep going and then um, we can always circle back at the end. Great. Um, so Abdullah is next, and this will be a treat for the French speakers in the audience. Um, Abdullah will be presenting his sections in French. So um, welcome, Abdullah. Bienvenue. Uh, merci, uh, merci, Johnny. So my name is Abdullah. I'm working with Pat has uh, Johnny, Johnny said, and I'm based in, in Senegal. And uh, for my presentation, I will, I will split myself in two in order to permit everybody to follow me. And the uh, Anglophone uh, will follow me with their, uh, with their uh, eyes because the slide will be in, 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 in English and the Francophone group will follow me with their, with their A's because I, am, I will speak in, uh, in, uh, in, in French. Uh, merci beaucoup. Donc, je vais parler de la, de la formation donc, euh, concernant les activités, les activités de drone. Donc, euh, euh, dans quel contexte doit-on former donc, les acteurs euh, évoluant autour euh, des activités de drone L'industrie de drone continue de croître et se développe à un rythme très rapide. Et il est crucial aujourd'hui que les pilotes et les opérateurs fassent de même pour, euh, pour suivre ce, 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 ce même rythme. Et la formation doit faciliter euh, le développement rapide de l'utilisation des drones et en même temps doit maintenir la sécurité et la sûreté donc, euh, dans toutes les opérations de drones alors que le trafic donc, augmente, alors que le trafic donc, va de plus en plus euh, vite. Pourquoi former les, les acteurs donc, on forme les acteurs autour du drone euh, pour qu'ils pour qu euh, puissent accomplir euh, leur mission. Les pilotes et les opérateurs doivent régulièrement, euh, doivent régulièrement rafraîchir leurs connaissances sur euh, les sujets suivants, les sujets que je vais décrire euh, tout à l'heure. Parce que, comme je l'ai dit, dit tantôt, l'industrie du drone croît très rapidement. Donc, il va falloir que les acteurs donc, suivent ce, 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 ce développement donc, euh, par la formation continue, euh, par euh, en fait, euh, les, les refresh training. Euh, les domaines sur lesquels ils doivent donc, se former donc, sont les suivants. Euh, la météorologie, la climatologie, donc l'aéronautique et prendre conscience donc, de la situation donc, euh, du, du, dans le domaine de l'aéronautique, dans, dans le pays au, dans lequel ils, ils opèrent. Euh, la gestion de l'espace aérien, parce que, en fait, ces acteurs euh, partagent l'espace aérien avec d'autres acteurs, donc il va falloir donc, apprendre à gérer cet espace et à coordonner avec l'autorité euh, de l'aviation civile qui gère donc euh, cet espace aérien. Le facteur humain. Donc, les facteurs humains doivent être impliqués aussi dans, dans les formations, euh, dans les opérations aériennes, parce que c'est un domaine très, très, très sensible. Donc, il va falloir donc, les prendre en compte dans, 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 les, dans les formations donc, euh, concernant les activités de drone. Les exigences de manutention des produits qu'ils livrent, parce que très souvent, c'est des, des produits donc, euh, très sensibles, euh, comme le sang, comme les vaccins, donc, comme les échantillons de laboratoire. Donc, il va falloir donc, euh, apprendre donc, à, à gérer ces, ces, ces produits donc, à, lors du transport, donc, à, les, à, à la manutention de ces produits. Donc, euh, parce que, comme je l'ai dit, ce, dont, ce sont des produits qui sont sensibles, donc il va à, donc apprendre à, à, à gérer et à, à manipuler. Slide. Donc, quels sont les acteurs 
donc, qu'on doit impliquer donc, lors de ces séances de formation. Euh, en premier lieu, donc, ce sont euh, les autorités de l'aviation civile donc, qui gèrent tout ce qui est régulation, tout ce qui est octroi de licences, donc de permis donc, de, 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 de faire voler des drones. Il va falloir les impliquer. Le ministère de la Santé, donc, euh, qui gère tous les produits donc qu'on est censé euh, transporter, donc il va falloir les impliquer euh, dans, ces, dans ces actions de formation. Donc euh, on doit aussi euh, impliquer le ministère de l'Intérieur et le ministère de la Défense qui gèrent donc euh, les problèmes de sécurité et de sûreté. On doit aussi impliquer le ministère donc, du Transport qui est en général le ministère tutelle où les le, le transports par drone euh, doivent, doivent s'insérer. Euh, les euh, fabricants de drones ne doivent pas aussi être euh, donc laissés en rade. Les fonctionnaires locaux aussi, donc si je prends exemple de notre projet donc, drone au Sénégal, nous avons donc impliqué dès le début du processus le maire de la localité, le préfet de la localité et tous les fonctionnaires et les autorités donc, qui sont au niveau au niveau local. Nous avons aussi invité la communauté, donc les autorités religieuses, donc pour que en fait, pour que en fait qu'ils soient, pour qu'ils soient donc impliqués dans, dans les actions donc euh, de, 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 de gestion donc d'opérations de, de drones, donc du début à la fin, parce qu'en fait c'est des acteurs très sensibles en général qui ne, ne, ne connaissent pas donc, euh, très bien donc, les activités de drones. Il va falloir les sensibiliser, donc les impliquer dans ces, dans ces activités pour qu'ils soient donc, euh, plus ou moins au même niveau que, que, que les autres acteurs. Nous avons aussi euh, impliqué donc, un, une organisation appelée PSE, donc Plan Sénégal émergent, donc, qui est une, une, un démembrement du gouvernement qui, euh, qui, qui s'occupe de, de l'émergence du, du pays et des innovations donc, dans tous les secteurs. Nous les avons aussi donc, impliqués dès, dès le début de nos, de nos, de nos activités. Slide. Donc, comment concevoir donc, ces, 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 ces activités de, 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 de formation donc, Les premières questions qu'on doit se poser est sont donc de savoir que doivent savoir les gens qui opèrent efficacement et en toute sécurité donc, dans, ces, dans ces activités de transport donc de, de, par drone. Quelles sont les informations ou les données donc, qui doivent circuler et comment on doit les communiquer, comment on doit les, les, les gérer. Donc, on doit aussi donc, essayer de concevoir donc, les exigences réglementaires, donc basées sur ce que en fait, l'autorité de l'aviation civile a mis donc, en place donc, dans le pays euh, dans lequel on, on doit opérer. Les opérations aussi, on doit les prendre en compte et aussi euh, on doit prendre en compte donc, euh, la tenue de, de, des dossiers et l'établissement des rapports donc, qui sont en, en relation avec, avec l'activité de transport donc, euh, des, des produits par drone. Euh, la question qu'on doit se poser aussi est de savoir comment la formation continue va, 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 va soutenir le personnel existant et les, perso et les nouveaux personnels donc, qui sont en, en cas de roulement ou bien en cas de nouveau affectation. Donc, il va falloir donc, euh, comment essayer donc, de faire une formation continue et de prendre en compte ces, ces nouveaux employés. Et en définitive, il va falloir euh, élaborer des plans de formation. Donc, savoir aussi qui inviter, donc dresser des listes de participation, préparer les présentations qu'on va donc, dérouler au cours de la formation et l'ensemble des supports dont on aura besoin donc, lors de ces, de, de ces formations. Donc, voilà les quelques slides que j'ai euh, voulu euh, euh, partager avec vous. 
Joani, je vous, je vous remets la parole. Uh, Joani, you have, the, you, you have the floor. Thank you. Merci. Merci beaucoup, Abdoulaye. Um, I understand that Ashimed is back on. So let's move to his presentation next on inventory control and data management. Dr. Ashimed, I did introduce you while you were off online. So everyone has had an introduction to you and you can go right ahead with your presentation. Thank you. Ashimed? Thank you. I'm not hearing you. There we go. Thank yeah. you. Can you? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we hear you now. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much uh, for your passion. And I'm very happy to share uh, some experience we have uh, in terms of inventory control and supply chain and data management. So I know that you, you know many uh, topics uh, in terms of inventory control and supply chain management, but during this um, uh, presentation, I will be sharing with you uh, three main topics. The first one is to identify the current inventory system, and the second estimate the demand, and the last one is to adapt the drone delivery operations according to the system in place. So how can we do, uh, how can we identify the current uh, inventory system? So the best way to do that is to do, uh, to conduct the supply chain assessment or evaluations. During this stage, uh, we can know the best, what is the lever, uh, the, the maximum level, the minimum, the review uh, period, the emergency uh, checkpoint, then we can also know the best the type of logistic system to use it in this uh, context. And um, the second, as I mentioned before, is estimate the demand. So how can we uh, estimate the best demand? We need to conduct data collection of logistic. So uh, in this step, we can um, collect the previous uh, consumption, a physical stock of the period that we will be uh, choose together and record as to the stock out, then the loss. And those uh, data are essential to determine the demand. And after collecting um, and conducting this um, evaluation or assessment, we can now uh, look the way how to adapt uh, this um, to response to the request. So uh, in this step, we can estimate the number of flights requested according to the demand and also the, the, uh, we can define the type of logistic system we'll be uh, using. Uh, for example, it can be the on-demand delivery or the schedule. Del this decision will uh, depend to the context, also the demand. And why it is important um, to collect uh, those data or uh, look the way to build those um, topic during the workshop. This is important because we want to develop the realistic data network, uh, which integrates the existing data management system. Uh, so we want to develop the realistic drone delivery implementation phase. Both will be helping us to optimize the health supply chain and improve the availability of stock at the remote uh, lo locations. Next step, next slide, please. So who 
uh, will be involving uh, to solve this, uh, those, uh, these topics. The first stakeholders is the health workers. Um, as I mentioned before, the health workers will help us during the uh, supply chain assessment or evaluation to share the demand, to share the information that can allow us to estimate the demand. For example, they can uh, share the previous uh, consumption. They can also provide us to know the best existing uh, system of supply chain and know the level maximum and the minimum. Then we can also know the uh, review period. And the second stakeholder that is the, who, who, are, um, uh, who are more important are operators of drone or drone providers. Those one can help us to get more uh, characteristic in terms of technology, then this characteristic will be more helpful to estimate the best, uh, the number of flight, for example, and how uh, to schedule in advance the, the, the flight and so on. And uh, the NGO, um, which is the technical assistance in this uh, stage, can be more helpful to advise both uh, elf workers and drone operators to design the best uh, system which will be responding to the uh, system control. So uh, this is the those are the, the stakeholders that can help us to improve. Finally, I want to, to, to finish uh, by saying that as we mentioned before, it's more important to engage uh, all of this uh, stakeholder in this question, and they can help us to deal with best in advantage what system to use and what uh, uh, technology can be requested. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Ashimed. So we'll move into continuous improvement. And um, I just want to send a note to our speakers. So Arshimed and Innocent will present this. And then um, Abdullahi has one final presentation on regulatory. And so we need to shorten these presentations a bit <laughs> as we're getting short on time. So Arshimed and Innocent, if you can spend five minutes on continuous improvement, then we'll have five minutes for Abdullahi on regulatory. Thank you very much. So to you, Innocent and Arshimed. Thank you very much. And um, I think the concept of continuous improvement uh, definitely I believe is not a strange one for most of us uh, attending this one. And that's the more so reason why it also has got a space in the drones for health as you design the drones and the, uh, uh, the networks. And so the, what it is, is, is actually uh, the way we, we're looking at it is through the common, commonly known you know, acronym of uh, uh, DMAIC, which is actually define, measure, analyze, improve, and control. And I think this is quite self-explanatory for those that uh, have actually uh, undergone this particular process or a similar one, which is a plan, do, check, act, cycle. What you basically do is that across all the implementation that you do, you are actually getting lessons along the way, trying to understand how best you could be able to actually do things. Because definitely as you begin, there could be assumptions that you might have built into your processes. And you want to make sure that as you strike reality, you are able to actually adjust accordingly to make sure that you are actually uh, uh, aligning to the reality that is there. So um, what we look at is actually a, a mechanism to continuously track what needs to be changed for the better and then uh, making sure that you actually uh, uh, have a more uh, positive outlook. And why it is very important and because of the time uh, constraint, I'll just give you two or three quick reasons. The first one is that I think as I've said, there is always room for improvement in as basically each and every uh, activity that actually uh, everyone does. And so even in the Drones for Health, there is actually an opportunity for you to actually learn what 
uh, or how you can do things uh, in a much better way. But also it actually makes sure that you are actually uh, better responding to the needs of the beneficiaries. You remember how we are talking about making sure the engagement of the communities is actually done, and through that feedback loop that they will create, there are going to be questions around things that they would want to be seen done differently. And this is why continuous improvement becomes very important. But then overall, we are saying it increases the quality by ensuring efficiency and eliminating the non-value adding steps in the activity implementation. So you want to make sure that you're focusing your time, your efforts, your investments on the things that matter because they are the ones which are going to make sure that you have a seamless delivery in the work that we, you, you actually do. So I'll give it to Dr. Achmed to actually finish off the next slide. Over. Thank you, uh, Innocent. Uh, who need um, to be involved for continuous improvement. As you can look to your screen, we have the Minister of the Health, then go the drone providers, and how the government set it, for example, uh, CAA. And uh, also, we do not forget that we need also the community leaders to be uh, involved. So how can they do uh, continue improvement together. The first way is to have the regular uh, monitoring and evaluation meeting. So this is more helpful because it will help all stakeholders to know the best how they are and the lesson learned can be uh, shared one after another. The second way is to conduct some surveys. So we can conduct the community perfection, the performance and co study. The same time we are implementing and they learn more uh, what practice we can uh, improve or not. And the, 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 the another way that, that to, they can uh, do this is also to hold the quietly drawn uh, working group and commission meeting at the national and the provincial level. Together, partners can share experience and the results that they are um, achieving and see how they can improve it. And the last one is to organize the review. Organize the review and share the result that they have obtaining. It will be more helpful um, to, to see how to improve and continue improving the uh, system uh, management. And the last, the point that they can discuss during those uh, kind of meeting, the first one is ongoing drone delivery is operating as expected, for example. And if yes, they can continue. If not, they can share what, they, what are the challenges and they can uh, look the way how to solve the challenges uh, together. And also they can discuss if the drone delivery is performance, then other system and see the way how the drone delivery is more uh, performance and how to share uh, those data with others. In the moment that they saw that they have more result, which is more uh, good, in this time, they can think together how can be the plan to scale up and the plan for sustainability. So thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Ashimed and Innocent. And Abdullahi, please bring us home, s'il vous plaît. Okay, merci, merci beaucoup, uh, Joanny. Je pense que je vais présenter en, en, en quatre minutes. Uh, je vais présenter en fait la conformité uh, réglementaire donc en matière de d'opération de, 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 de drone. Donc, uh, comme vous le savez tous, donc tout au long de la mise en œuvre, uh, les opérations de drone uh, doivent répondre aux exigences nécessaires pour conserver l'autorisation euh, de voler. Cette autorisation qui, en général, est délivrée par l'autorité de l'aviation civile. Les réglementations relatives aux drones euh, varient considérablement d'un pays à, à l'autre, ce qui n'est pas facile pour les, opérations, pour les opérateurs de drones donc de se mouvoir donc, de pays en pays. Donc, il serait bon d'avoir une réglementation donc harmonisée au niveau, dans le continent pour permettre donc aux opérateurs 
de se mouvoir d'un pays à un autre plus facilement. On sait que l'Union africaine est en train d'en discuter, donc pour avoir une réglementation euh, harmonisée, mais jusqu'à présent, on ne l'a pas encore, donc, mais en attendant de l'avoir, chaque pays réglemente ses, euh, ses, propres, ses, propres, ses propres droits. Donc, pourquoi, avoir une, pourquoi se conformer donc, aux, aux réglementations en place euh, au, cours, au fur et à mesure que les opérations par drone se développent, euh, la sécurité doit rester une priorité donc, pour les opérateurs de drones, pour une durabilité à long terme donc, de, ces, de, ces, de cette opération. La conformité réglementaire permet de, 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 de garantir à euh, la sécurité donc, pour les opérateurs, pour les populations aussi, et d'assurer la coordination donc, entre les différents utilisateurs. Slide. Donc, quels sont les différents acteurs qu'on doit impliquer dans cette conformité réglementaire Ce sont en, en principe donc, trois grands groupes. Donc, les régulateurs, euh, pour que comprennent les, euh, les règlements, de, les, les règlements, la réglementation en ce qui concerne euh, les vols de drones, donc ainsi que les, les, les règlements sanitaires aussi doivent être euh, maîtrisés. Les opérateurs eux-mêmes, donc les pilotes en, en, en premier, qui sont en charge donc euh, des opérations de drones, euh, ainsi que les autres personnes donc en contact avec 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 le, le, le drone. Euh, les participants aussi euh, qui évoluent autour du système donc logistique et ayant des interactions avec les opérations de drones de façon quotidienne donc, doivent donc, euh, être impliqués dans cette euh, conformité euh, réglementaire. Slide. Euh, maintenant, comment mettre en place donc, ces, cette, 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 cette conformité réglementaire Là aussi, il euh, y a en principe euh, trois domaines dans lesquels on doit, on doit travailler. La réglementation du drone couvre en général donc, ces trois sections. Les règles générales d'exploitation euh, en vigueur dans le pays où on opère, les certificats et les licences qui doivent être octroyés aux pilotes et aux acteurs donc, par euh, l'autorité de l'aviation civile, et la demande d'autorisation de vol qui doit être adressée à l'autorité de l'aviation civile euh, pour être en règle avec les euh, avec l'autorité donc avant de procéder à ces à ces opérations de drone. Euh, pour terminer donc je dirais que la conformité des opérations en cours nécessite une communication avec les organismes de réglementation afin de comprendre les exigences en cours dans les pays dans lesquels on, on opère et de les tenir à chaque fois informés. Donc, merci Joanny. Voilà les quelques slides que je voudrais donc partager avec vous. Merci pour votre attention. Merci beaucoup à vous, Abdoulaye, and also to Archimed and Innocent. And that concludes our section on implementation. Thank you all for giving us great things to think about as we move forward. And over to you, Gabo. Yes, thank you. Well, we are at the final few minutes of our meeting here today. Um, so we will wrap up right now, but I just wanna start by saying a huge thank you to everyone um, who has presented today to our facilitators and for the really wonderful and lively discussion in the chat and in the small groups. Really happy to see so many questions, so many comments, so many people interacting. And I have makes me have a good feeling about the next uh, two days of our workshop where we're gonna be doing a lot more interaction together. So thank you everyone. Um, so tomorrow we have day two, which is gonna be our doing day. Um, taking what we learned today, taking all of the information and working through some of it, use it, utilizing a case study that we are going to present to you tomorrow. So that's gonna be the same time tomorrow, same place. Um, we did figure out, uh, we got some uh, support from Zoom on the back end. We figured out how to get the interpretation tomorrow. It seemed like it was a glitch in the system with our meeting, which is really unfortunate for today, uh, but we will have um, one group for the French speakers as well too. Um, and so tomorrow what we're gonna do is we're gonna have a little bit of a recap. 
we're going to introduce taking all of these concepts and actually how you put them into a workshop and how you do them through these system design workshops. And then we're going to spend most of our time tomorrow actually going through a rapid fire workshop together. Um, we're going to be doing that in small groups in facilitation teams, and it's going to be all pretty much the whole time of our meeting tomorrow. Um, so come prepared to talk, come prepared to participate. Um, it'll be much less listening and a lot more doing tomorrow. Um, we're going to be using the software called Miro. Uh, to do that small group work, which we will introduce to you tomorrow. There's no need to download the software. Um, all you'll need tomorrow is to just see the Zoom screen as well too. And if you wanna open up the software, you can do that through your web browser, but you don't have to tomorrow. Um, and I do wanna just leave you all with a little bit of homework before you come back tomorrow. Um, in our email that we sent out on Thursday or Friday morning for some of you, um, we sent a link to a case study. It's just a four page document, um, a Google Doc. Um, Sierra will put the link to that in the chat again. Um, there's a French version and an English version. If you could just take 10 minutes and review this case study before tomorrow, it'll really help set you up well to do our activity. We will go through it again all together as a group, but if you can spend you know, five or 10 minutes just reviewing the text, it'll be very helpful for tomorrow. Um, and again, that link was sent last week and Sierra just put the links in the chat as well. Um, if you have any other questions before tomorrow, you can feel free to reach out to our team at info at updogupdwg.org. Uh, most of you should have that email address through the Zoom registration link. And that is it for today. So we will close it out and we look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Again, a big thanks for joining today. I know it was a lot of content, but really excited for tomorrow and seeing you all apply that content uh, to a system design workshop. So thank you, everybody, and we will see you same time, same place tomorrow. Have a good rest of your night or have a good rest of your day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Goodbye. Bye. Have a good journey.